We will continue with our study on the covenants today, but we're going to take a, an important portion that is not usually covered in the study of the covenants. Most studies you will find uh, don't address the role of the prophets, the role of the prophets in the covenants of the scripture. In order for us to understand that, I need to start by the quick explanation that in the Old Testament there were three titles that were held by the people of Israel that were considered to be people in contact with God. The one was the king, the king of Israel, who God gave messages to, or who had the divine right. The second set was the priests who worked in the temples. They had communication with God, and they had the divine right to be there, serving on behalf of the people, serving before God. The third were the prophets. The prophets were those that represented God and brought His message to the people. They brought the message to the people of God to be given to who? to be given to the world. Now, we don't have, we don't have the option in the Old Testament to say that the prophet gave their own opinion. When the prophets spoke, they spoke on behalf of God. That was it. And it is for that reason, when we read our Bible, we can safely say, that in such and such a portion of the Bible, God said this. Am I right or am I wrong? We can go to scripture and say, God said in the Bible, in such and such a book, in such and such a chapter, and this passage, God said this. So when we have a message from God through a human being, it is who speaking to us? It is God speaking to us. If a prophet, if a prophet speaks anything that is contrary to what God has already said, what do we think of that prophet? A prophet must support everything that God has said before. He cannot change it. He cannot alter it. He cannot give his own opinion. Therefore, we need to look at what is the objective of God in the Bible. And we know that through the covenants. In the covenants, we know, we've re we have reviewed already. We have the Edenic co covenant or the Adam Ad Adamic covenant, sorry. Then we have the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. The Sinaitic Covenant, or the Covenant of Moses, which has three parts in it, you remember? The one part is the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. We won't have time to go into the details now. And then the Davidic Covenant, which promises the seed who will be not only son of man, but son of God. And then we have the fulfillment of the covenant in Jesus Christ. But the all-encompassing covenant that takes us from sin to salvation that takes us from Genesis to Revelation is the one fundamental covenant which is the covenant of Abraham. It is in the covenant of Abraham that God says that through you I will save the whole world, all nations. Through you I will bless all nations. And how will I save all nations? I will give you a seed. I will give you 
descendants who will be like the stars of the sky or the sand of the sea, and then I will give them land where they can be successful and make sure that out of them comes that one seed who is going to be the savior of the world, the king of kings, and he is going to be the king whose throne will last forever. That is Jesus Christ. So if that is the plan of salvation, every prophet that comes in the name of that same God who gave that covenant in the book of Genesis must support that covenant. And what is that covenant? God said what? That people will be saved by their works or by? By grace. Where do we see that? We see that in Adam being covered by the skin of those animals. Whose work was that? Was it the work of Adam that made those skins? No, the work of Adam was the fig leaves. The work of God was the grace that covered the sin of Adam and Eve. When we say in Abraham, in chapter, three, uh, chapter 15 of Genesis, God says he did what? He believed and it was counted to him righteousness. Then we go to Moses. Now, God gave the Ten Commandments as a mirror, as the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans. God gave the Ten Commandments so people can see that they are in need of a Savior, that they're in need of confession, that they have to make a sacrifice. And that sacrifice represented Jesus Christ. Though the people of Israel were not saved, they did not get salvation by keeping the Ten Commandments. They didn't, because they couldn't. And they didn't keep the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments showed them their sin that they may go and confess their sins in the temple and through the confession of their sin, they would then be forgiven. And annually, the annual feasts gave them an opportunity as a nation to confess. On the first day of the month of Tishri, the seventh month, there was a 10-day period of judgment. And then on the 10th day of Tishri, there was a day of atonement where God provided the verdict, either guilty or not guilty. That was the Day of Atonement. And so the people were forgiven. It was all done by grace, not by works. Then Jesus came, and Jesus said what? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I will give you life. I will give you life. So the entire Bible is about grace. So every person, every prophet who claims to be a prophet of God must be in harmony with that covenant. This is the covenant of salvation, the covenant of redemption through the grace of God. When a prophet goes contrary to the teaching of the word of God, then that becomes a problem. In the Old Testament, the Bible is divided. First five books of Moses. After the book of, books of Moses, we have uh, the books that we call the books of history, in which we have judges and kings and so on. Then we have poetry, uh, Psalms and Solomons and uh, the, the Song of Solomon. Uh, after the poetry, we have the prophets. We have the major prophets and we have the minor prophets. Major prophets are who? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. These are the major prophets. And then we have 12 minor prophets. Minor prophets. And the minor prophets are from uh, Hosea and all the way to Malachi. Now, often we don't include, because John the Baptist didn't write anything, but John the Baptist is considered the last Old Testament prophet because he came before the ministry of Jesus Christ. But all of the prophets, when you look at their messages, what are the prophets doing? The prophets are pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And they're also telling the people of Israel that you guys are breaking the covenant. You are breaking the agreement. So you need to come back in line that God may give you the land of Canaan and that he may preserve you for the time until the Messiah comes. That is not, by the way, I should mention, the covenant of Moses, 
The promises made in the covenant of Moses, the promises were not for eternal life. The promises were for the land of Canaan. That if you keep these, I will give you the promised land. Symbolically, for the race, the human race, it is true that if we keep the commandments in Jesus Christ, we will be given the promised land. Now, when the people of Israel either transgressed the law or went after other gods, they were punished and the, uh, then the uh, prophets went to them and said, listen, you need to straighten out. And I got to tell you, we don't see too many prophets that are very popular. You don't see many prophets when they walk in, everybody stands up and honors them. More often than not, the prophets are just tied, chastised and they're hated. They're persecuted and sometimes killed. That was a prophet. What is the meaning of the word prophet? Now, if you were to say, what does prophet mean? The first answer is that person who foretells the future. The word prophet means to say, to, to, to make a statement before. But the word before applies to two places or, or, or two items, let's call it. It means to say before time and before place. What does that mean? If I'm going to prophesy, I can prophesy before the time comes that is foretelling. But prophesying in, in, in space means I can prophesy in front of someone. You get it? I can prophesy in front of a person or a body of people. So prophecy means two things. And too often, too often, last week I studied so much on this and I find it very difficult, very few people decipher the difference because they take that word prophecy and hang on to the understanding that it means to foretell the future. And therefore, they look for the future telling prophets in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, we have prophets who prophesy when, in, in, in time that such and such will happen. And so we have several thousand prophecies. We have at least a couple of thousand prophecies in the Old Testament, and it prophesies in time. Question. How many of those prophecies failed? How many biblical prophecies have failed? One, two, three. If all of those prophets, we had 12 plus 4, 16 prophets, major and minor prophets. If all those 16 prophets we have a couple of thousand prophecies and not one failed. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 18 that if one prophecy fails, you know that the prophet is not from God. Let me speak to that for just a moment. Why is it that a prophet must be right on prophesying the future must be right in order for us to understand that we have to understand God in that God is all powerful omnipotent God is omniscient he knows everything and God is omnipresent so not only does God know everything God lives in the past a billion years and he lives in the future a billion years and if if to God, the future is just like one second, like immediate. God can experience the, the past as if it was happening in this very moment. God can experience the future as if it's happening this very moment. So then when God gives a message to a prophet, what are the chances that God is going to make a mistake? God lives beyond time. He cannot make a mistake. Therefore, God tells us that if anybody claims to be a prophet, 
related to a future event or a future instance that's going to happen, a prophesied, if that person is wrong one time, you can be guaranteed that that person is wrong and is not from God. Make sense? We have 16 prophets. Not one mistake. Then, the New Testament. The New Testament prophecy is a little different than the Old Testament prophecy. New Testament prophecy means proclaiming the message. Confirming what the Old Testament prophets said. So when the Old Testament prophets said that Jesus was going to come and they were supporting the covenant of salvation, the Old Testament prophets, when that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the New Testament prophets look backward and point to the prophecy being fulfilled as it was predicted. The New Testament prophets don't look forward and make additional prophecies. They look backward and say, look, this was fulfilled, and so salvation is in Jesus Christ. The New Testament prophes prophets prophesy in space, not in time. You understand? They prophesy before the people. They prophesy before large numbers of people and in private. Old Testament prophets prophesied in time and in space. New Testament prophets prophesy in space. Therefore, the apostle Peter says, when he is preaching, Acts chapter 2. I'm sorry I haven't yet gone to the Bible. I've uh, been a little too enthusiastic and I'm going to explain as to why I'm talking about all of this. Acts chapter 2. And there, oh, I'm... Losing my mind. Old age, I think. Acts chapter 2. And go with me to what the Apostle Peter says. Verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will do what? Prophesy. What is he talking about? Were the people foretelling the future? Is that what they were doing? No. They were preaching. They were proclaiming. So the prophecy in the New Testament is the proclamation of the fulfillment of the prophecy that took place in Jesus Christ. This is not a passage that can be used to lift up a new Prophet and say, oh, the prophet Joel said there's going to be a prophet. Therefore, this is our prophet. That ain't it. That's not it. That is misusing. Misusing the prophecy and the Bible to fit your own story. That is not biblical. It isn't. The Bible tells us in Matthew 24. That in the last days, many, prof many prof false prophets will come. Many false prophets will come. And then Deuteronomy 13 tells us that if you have someone who claims to be a prophet, but he misdirects you from what you have been taught by God about that God, turn away from that prophet. In fact, kill the prophet. Now, when we study Deuteronomy 13, we're told that that prophet must be in line and harmony with the Word of God. When somebody begins to change the Word of God, then that becomes a problem. In Deuteronomy 18.22, tells us the same thing. I'm going to take you to Deuteronomy 18. And we'll come back to Deuteronomy 18 a little later in the sermon. Verse 
22. If a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord and it does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has, spoke, has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Don't pay attention to a prophet who, who prophesies something and it doesn't come true. Go to Deuteronomy 13. We read that earlier. We will not read the entire passage that we read earlier, but we'll go to Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces you a sign or wonder, and if that sign or wonder spoken of takes place, in other words, even if it comes true, and the prophet says, let us follow another God. In other words, that prophet changes your method of salvation. That prophet changes your plan of salvation. That's what other gods are about, because other gods give you eternal life, afterlife. So if somebody gives you a different way of eternal life, it's a wrong prophet. Stone that prophet. Kill that prophet. Go to Isaiah. Chapter 8. And verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8. There verse 20. Okay. Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anybody does not speak according to this word, they have no light in them. In the King James it will say, if anybody speaks not according to the law and the testimonies, there is no truth in them. What is the other word for testimony? Covenant. Testimony, testament, covenant, it is the same thing. If somebody does not speak according to that covenant, there is no truth in them. How much? No truth in them. Now, I want to explain a little bit about why we're studying this. I grew up in a church where the foundational doctrine which I taught, I preached, I believed, was that someday God is going to come, but prior to that, I'm going to be judged. And everybody was going to be judged. And when we're judged, we will be judged not only on what we did, but what we confessed and what we may have forgotten to confess. And that judgment started in a certain year Year 1844. And I don't know when my name has come up. And my name have already, may already have been brought up. And I may have already been found guilty or innocent. And I'm still living. It's called investigative judgment. Not too long ago, we began to worship as, a, as an independent group. Not on theological reasons on administrative reasons. And as an independent group, we had discussions on the question of the investigative judgment. And as the discussions got deeper, some thoughts, studies that I had been part of many, many, many years ago, they began to come back. I was still in school when the question of the investigative judgment was questioned by Dr. Desmond Ford. I went through it. I decided I would stay with the church and continue to support the doctrine. To the extent that I was considered, I think, as a pastor, a pretty right-wing, conservative pastor. I used to not only pastor a church, I was also conducting evangelistic crusades. Just so happened last week, I was going through some books and I know I have some sample or some leftover brochures from an evangelistic crusade. I happened to find one called the Abundant Life Lecture Series. October 22 starting date. Funny enough, October 22, 1994. 
In it, we have various subjects, including the Sabbath. But once again, I made the mistake, like most Adventists make, what is a true day of worship? It really should be, what is a true day of Sabbath? Not worship. Every day is a day of worship. The last day events, and to watch out, the world is coming to an end. And then in the back, they have a picture of me. I think I look uh, a little bit younger. But we held crusades and taught the investigative judgment. So just, I'm clarifying this like the Apostle Paul clarified his, his qualifications. This is not to brag. It's just to make a statement that I'm not speaking out of ignorance. I'm intimately aware of the details of Seventh-day Adventist theology. I used to teach it. I used to hold crusade. Then while I was there, I happened to find this. This is a little book called Adventist Affirm. Again, a right-wing, ultra-conservative theological journal. In here, the writers, there's an article by Ellen White. There's an article by Laurel Dempsey. She's the wife of a professor at Andrews University. Then we have William Fagel, who had the very major, major television program uh, called Faith for Today. Uh, then Samuel Corentang Pippen. Pippen, he had some personal issues. But until then, he was considered the up-and-coming strongest star of the Adventist Church in theology, Dr. Pippen. Then over top of there is me. I had an article introduced by Dr. Mervyn Maxwell. Dr. Mervyn Maxwell was a great friend of mine. He was a teacher. And he was the one who talked with me about getting involved in writing. And after this article was written, Dr. Roger Kuhn, who used to be in charge of the Ellen White estate, asked me to, he recommended me to the Review and Herald to see if I could write a couple of books. One on worship and one on Pentecostalism. And it was about that time that I got very sick. And I wasn't able to continue either in ministry or in writing. But... I tell you this, and I don't talk about it often, but the only reason I tell you this, because I have spent some time studying the depth of scriptures, and now I find that there is an issue that I have found in an honest restudying some of that material. And that material I speak of today is the investigative judgment. And the reason that prophet becomes important is because that investigative judgment, the doctrine of the investigative judgment, which I believe is completely contrary to the message of grace. And therefore it is contrary to the message of Jesus Christ. How is it possible that such a doctrine can be the foundation of a major church that is growing, one of the fastest, in fact, the fastest growing church in North America, and one of the fastest in the world. A friend of mine, Dr. Roy Adams, wrote a book some years ago. I have it at home. I read it again and again. It's called The Sanctuary, the heart of the Adventist message. The heart. That is the core of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But as you study that doctrine, you find that that doctrine has no legs unless you believe and you accept the prophecies and the, and the interpretation of one prophetess called Ellen G. White. There are those who claim, oh, no, no, we can find that without Ellen White. You cannot. I will, another week, I will explain to you that Ellen White was not the person who came up with that explanation of the investigative judgment or the date of the investigative judgment. But when she claimed to be a prophet and the people believed that she was a prophet, she was able to put her stamp of approval on the message of the investigative judgment that really came through somebody else. In another week, I will show how everything that Ellen White taught, whether it's health, dress, whether it's 
uh, the, the, the investigative judgment, whether it's the Sabbath, all of these teachings never came to her first from God. They came from somebody else that she adopted and then saw in vision. If I was to measure another prophet just on that alone, I would have to say that prophet is not a prophet of God. I will spend more time on the investigative judgment showing how that particular message is not a message from God, but it's contrary to the message of God. In my study, I have already reviewed the defense of Ellen White. The stars of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the theologians, the preachers have defended Ellen White. I have looked at the defense, very eloquent, and the most eloquent, Dr. Dwight Nelson. Very, not only eloquent, but smug, but dishonest. Sorry, Dr. Wright. I am floored, surprised, and disappointed by the, dis, by, by the dishonesty in the defense of Ellen White that you presented in your series. I expect that one by one, I will take that defense and prove that it is not only wrong and unbiblical, but dishonest. I've looked at Doug Batchelor, Stephen Bohr. I even have looked at Walter Reith from South, America, South Africa, now out of Canada. And recently, I ended up studying Dennis Preeb, Dr. Dennis Preeb, to see what his response is. And they all fall short. The level of dishonesty. I can say this. Either these folks don't know how to study scripture. Or they willfully mislead. I'm looking for a response from the church on this. Which one is it? Which one is it? Because I will take each one. And one by one show that it is neither biblical nor honest. Now, I want to take the balance of today's time and cover just a handful of things, prophecies, that Ellen White claimed to be from God. And I want to show you the failure of these prophecies and the incorrect information given by her that she claimed that came from God. To begin with, the time of the beginning of the investigative judgment, 1844, was discovered by William Miller through his personal studies. In the book, Early Writings, Ellen White writes about William Miller, and she says that I was shown that God visited Brother Miller time and time again to give him and reinforce the correct date of October 22, 1844, that Jesus would return. Now you tell me, if your prophet says that that brother is correct and Jesus doesn't come, who was talking to the prophet? The date of Christ's return was initially 1843. Then Ellen White said, no, there was a mistake made because when God was showing the date, his hand covered the date so it wasn't clearly visible. Really? The creator of this world the creator of this universe who knows everything doesn't know that his hand is covering the date and he allowed the wrong date to be given? In early writings, in the year 1850, in the book, Early Writings, page 67, it's recorded that Ellen White says, only a few months 
remain when Christ returns. Only a few months. We have only months to learn what others have learned in years. So better get studying because Jesus is coming. Now, why do you need to study if Jesus is coming anyways? But guess what? That was 1850 and those months have long gone and Jesus didn't come. Recorded Testimonies, Volume 1, page 260. Ellen White says, before the civil war in America that divides the country, before that ends, Jesus will return. Guess what? Is the civil war still going on in America? Well, yeah, some would say. No. Civil war ended in 1865. Volume 1 of Testimonies, page 64. The year 1850. Ellen White says an angel came to him and he says, get ready, get ready, get ready. For the end is here. A few months, she says. Nothing. Jesus didn't come. In 1862, recorded in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 259. He says, England will declare war on America and America will be destroyed to the, like the dust of this earth. Now, maybe this in the future, but she intended for it to be back then. England didn't declare war on America. And America is just fine. Thank you very much. Volume 1, page 131, 132. She says, some that are here now. Some will be dead, but some that are present here will be alive when Jesus comes. Who is still alive that was with her? Not one. Not one. Early writings, page 35. Slavery will not be abolished. Slavery will still be practiced when Jesus returns. Was slavery in America abolished? Is it still practiced? No. This one is especially difficult to explain, but I think I have found an explanation. There was a man named Joseph Bates. We'll hear about him later on. He's the man who came up with the introduction of the Sabbath. He was a, quite a good student of scripture. And he wasn't a big fan of Ellen White. He didn't really believe her. He was also a sailor. He had an interest in astronomy. Because sailors use astronomy for sailing. He had a deep interest in astronomy. But no matter how much Ellen White and her husband tried, she, he just wouldn't become a believer. So, to get, to make an attachment with him on astronomy, she conveniently had a vision. Okay, here's the vision. In vision, an angel took her to Jupiter and Saturn. And there she saw people that were much more beautiful than the people of Earth. But they were huge, they were giants. And she had a conversation with the angels, so how come these people are so beautiful? And there, you know who else she saw on Jupiter? Or Saturn, we don't know. Enoch. She saw Enoch there. Interestingly enough, her husband verified that she had this vision, and he wrote about it in the uh, book called A Word to the Little Flock, page 22. And when she told this vision to Joseph Bates about what Saturn was about, and I think she said they had nine moons or something. I don't know. I, I don't have the entire vision written here, but I'll share it with you later. 
Joseph Bates became a believer in Ellen White. Now tell me, is that fraud? And before, Ellen White was a voracious reader. She's a great reader. Do you know who wrote about giants on Saturn? It was the French writer, Voltaire. How is it that Ellen White's definition of people on Saturn is exactly the same as Voltaire's? It's kind of hard to explain. This one I think you can answer. When was the Tower of Babel built? Before the flood or after the flood? Huh? They built the tower so the world would never be destroyed, so they would never be destroyed by water again. Therefore, it was built before the flood or, this is a hint, after the flood. It was after the flood. For all you great Bible students. Ellen White says it was built before the flood. The Ellen White estate tried to explain that by saying, oh, no, no, that was a mistake. That was a, that was a typing mistake. With it. So they tried to correct it. But, unfortunately, that's exactly what she said. She also prophesied that Jerusalem would never be rebuilt. Is Jerusalem rebuilt? Jerusalem is rebuilt. This one here, I just don't understand where she got this. This may have been a vision. I'm not sure. She said she saw that angels of God were ministering to people and going back and forth to heaven and to the people. But in order to get into heaven, God had given each of them a little gold card. Early writings, page 39. God gave them a little gold card. I think a gold card is a good idea. But I don't know how anybody thought of a gold card back 1850s. So that must have been a vision. Because gold cards just came around. The plastic ones anyways came now. That must have been real gold. Not the fake gold we have now. And the angels each had their identity card, the gold card, which they showed to get in and out of heaven. This one here, if you are a person of color like me, this should be a little bit offensive. In the Gospel Herald, this is a magazine, March 1, 1901, paragraph 20. It says, in, all, in, in heaven, all, oh, actually she starts by this. In heaven there will be no lines of color. No prejudice. You know why? Because in heaven, everybody is going to be white. Like Jesus. Come on now. All you Adventists out there that are not white, you're going to have an opportunity now to become white when you get to heaven. I don't know how many of you desire to be white, but that's what you're going to be. I will give you the, <laughs> in my rushed state, I did not write down the reference for this, but I'll give it to you, maybe the next week or so. Ellen White had such a great relationship with God, she claims, that she had free access to God whenever she wanted. God gave her an angel, through an angel, God gave her this little blue cord that had to be wrapped up around something and kept. And whenever she wanted to see God, all she had to do was pull the cord and she would be taken to God. I'm not making this up, guys. Really, I'm not making this. This is all recorded. And the angel said, don't leave the cord just uh, 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 unfurled for too long. 
Because the, the, the cord will, will ruin the shape of the cord. So make sure it doesn't stay curled up too long. So often, open the cord so you can go and see God. I could spend hours, hours sharing what I have found. Others have taken an approach to questioning Ellen White, but I have not yet found a comprehensive research as we're going to take part of here, to, here, not today, but in future. There are questions to be answered on science, on health, on the gospel. But I ask you this question. Go to 1 John chapter 4 and 1. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. This is important because you and I have to make a decision today. Those of you that are in church and those of you that are online. 1 John 4 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I ask you, when the Bible is complete, the Old Testament pointing forward with time prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, and the New Testament being complete, proclaiming the message of the gospel, with the book of Revelation standing tall, with the prophecies of the last days. The Bible does not make room for a new prophet when the Bible says that you will have prophets. 1 Thessalonians 5. What we're talking about is, that, and in Corinthians, Paul says that you should all desire to be prophets. What's he talking about? Is he saying we should all foretell the future? No! You should be prophets in space, not time. You should be proclaiming the message of the gospel. You don't need a new prophet to interpret the Bible. What did the Bible say? What does God tell us? I will send you a new comforter. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind what God has written in the Bible. You don't need another person to tell you what the Bible, may, what the Bible says. You don't need it. Especially when that person does not qualify. We are told that they have to be 100% correct. In just 20 minutes, I've shown you 15 items where she is deadly wrong. She's not from God. Then where is she from? The Bible tells us we can't stone her. She's dead. But you can certainly reject her teachings. And if you're going to reject her teachings, you have to walk away from the investigative judgment because without Ellen White, the investigative judgment does not stand. You have a false prophet teaching you false things and I will go into the theology of the investigative judgment not now in about 10 to 12 weeks. For now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We are just a little church just a little group, but we want to make sure that we're true to the scripture. That we go only to the Bible to learn the word of God. And when we find that the word of God is being changed, we need to point that out. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Many false prophets will come and they will deceive. My friends, there's almost 25 million people being deceived by Ellen White. Your friends, your family, my friends, my family. And it is for this reason that I find it's absolutely imperative that we point out the reality of a false prophet. Because your salvation is in jeopardy. Matthew 7 verse 15 Matthew 7, verse 15, if you will. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but in inwardly but inwardly they are ferocious wolves inwardly they are ferocious wolves by by their fruit you will recognize them do you know if you read the private life of ellen white you would be surprised that the public image that we have been given of ellen white is not accurate she was a controlling demanding person who was held up so high by the people not like the true prophets of the bible who were despised who were rejected who were questioned she was almost as close to worship of a human as you can get not only then but even today if you say what i'm saying in front of a seventh day adventist the ears will burn and they may explode because of what has been done to this person that they call a prophet jeremiah chapter 28 jeremiah chapter 28 verse 9 but the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one who truly sent by the lord only if his predictions come true even if they're predicting peace if it doesn't come true that's not a prophet we just saw her prophecies fail one after the other jeremiah 23 verses 24 who can hide in secret places so that i cannot see them declares the lord this is what we were talking about god being omnipresent Do I do not I fill the heaven and earth declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams that tell one another will make my people forget my name just as the ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. The word of God must be spoken faithfully. When the Adventist church uses Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and claims that Ellen White is that prophet that Joel talked about that is a fraud that is a fraud because peter tells us in acts chapter 2 that the fulfillment of the prophecy of joel was the preaching of the word of god not foretelling the future the world does not need another prophet The word of God, the plan of salvation, redemption is complete in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We don't need present truth, which is dispensational theology. We don't need new truth. What we need is a focus on Jesus Christ and him alone. That through his righteousness, that through his death and resurrection that we may be saved. If you have friends relatives that are adventists please point them to this message today that they may go back and check what I have shared with you today in the weeks to come I will be sharing information about people from whom Ellen White took their material and claimed that it was a vision. We will discuss William Foy, Hazen Foss, Delbert Baker, Joseph Turner, Joseph Bates, Hiram Madsen, Dr. Jackson, Apollos Hale. I know the folks at the Ellen White estate know these names. And you've not answered the accusations honestly. We're going to ask and the reason we have to ask because you are taking people down the path to hell away from the message of grace 
into the message of righteousness by works. No matter what it takes, no matter how difficult, we will pick up and point to the word of God and challenge that you do the same. That we study the word of God and examine everything. Next week will be part two of the message today. And I hope that you let your friends and family know about this study. Because it's important to know the false prophets among us. May God bless each of you as you continue to study in your homes. Don't take my word for it. Go back and study for yourselves. And I hope that you pray for me as I pray for you. That through our study we get closer to God and to one another. God bless you.